Denver. Denver, what can I say about her? Fantastic. Denver, beautiful. Denver, multifaceted. People, culture. My favorite thing was teaching aerobics at the Glen Arm in Five Point for 28 and a half years. The people that came to class across the board culturally, I met so many different people that enriched and enhanced my life. And so they always thought that I was giving to them. They didn't know they were really giving to me, so. <laughs> Living in Denver and um, having family and raised a family in Denver has been a life-changing experience. To stave off winter's unpredictable behavior and its consequential traffic conditions, some Colorado drivers resort to rather primitive, if not obsolete, methods. Weather vanes, sundials, maps. More effective in blocking windshields than giving directions. Winter driving resources, however, prepare drivers with real-time updates and alerts. Cotrip.org Email and text alerts Calling 511 And Facebook and Twitter I believe that's called social media All far more useful methods than, say, sticking one's head out of the sunroof Clearly no shot at a career in meteorology for that one Learn more about winter driving in the wild at winter.codot.gov You have things you've been wanting to say. Ideas you love and believe in and just can't keep to yourself any longer. Denver Community Media is a welcoming and supportive environment and is your one-stop location for access to state-of-the-art production resources and the video tools, the creative space, everything you need to make your ideas come to life. You have something to say. Let's give it some air. Let's make it happen with Denver Community Media. Welcome to the Safety, Housing, Education, and Homelessness Committee of Denver City Council. The Safety, Housing, Education, and Homelessness Committee begins now. Good morning. This is the Safety, Housing, and Education and Homelessness Committee of the Denver City Council. I'm your chair, Councilwoman Robin Kanich. I'm an at-large member of the City Council. I will have my colleagues introduce themselves, starting to my right. Uh, thank you, Kevin Flynn, Southwest Denver's District 2. Stacy Gilmore, District 11. Uh, good morning, Paul Cashman, South Denver, District 6. Jamie Torres, Council District 3. Amanda Sandoval, Northwest Denver, District 1. Good morning, Amanda Sawyer, District 5. Thank you. I don't believe we have any colleagues online. I will acknowledge them if they join us. Well, we have one action item today, and then we have some presentations, all of them involving our Citizen Oversight Board, and they provide oversight and connection to our Office of Independent Monitor. I'm actually going to be the sponsor of our ordinance today, and I'm going to provide a little introduction before I turn it over to our Citizen Oversight Board. So we're here with an action item, which is action item 1114. And if our staff can please upload um, that so it's visible in our system so council members can access the materials. Thank you so much. So um, sorry for the history always with me in my 12th year going back in time. Um, 
So our citizen oversight board um, came to city council, you know, through the years with areas of concern and areas of interest in strengthening their oversight and strengthening the role of the independent monitor in its oversight of our public safety agencies. And some of those conversations were occurring in 2015 and 2016. And um, members of council, myself, Councilman Paul Cashman and Councilman Paul Lopez, worked with them to bring forward a package of um, improvements to the powers of the independent monitor. That ordinance came forward actually in 2017. And that package included a number of strengthenings, um, clarifications, some of them regarding um, you know, the, the, the oversight over the chief and the sheriff themselves. It included some clarifications um, regarding um, when officers were charged with a crime. It included a number of clarifications. One of the things we did was to expand the size of the Citizen Oversight Board so we could actually have better representation of our city. And it also included some questions and discussions about how that board was appointed. I want to say this very clearly. The board has always been pretty tenacious. <laughs> The board was directly appointed solely by the mayor up until 2017, and it was tenacious. They brought us letters uh, demanding uh, body cams long before the state legislature even breathed the word body cam. A board solely appointed by the mayor was clamoring for body cams and then clamoring for stronger policies about turning those body cams on and getting access to the footage. Um, a board solely appointed by the mayor and um, you know, was, was concerned about shooting into moving vehicles and supporting the independent monitor with stronger policies about that. Um, we actually had a tenacious board, but there was a concern about the appearance of the independence of that board when it was solely appointed by the mayor. And so we actually had a robust discussion and we changed the appointments of the board to be half um, council and half mayoral. But there was still this feeling that it was a little too direct, that political appointments. And so we had a kind of, you know, a number of proposals that were discussed. And the feeling was there was a desire for a buffer. And so we looked at the judicial system. And the judicial system includes this thing called a nominating committee. And the nominating committee, you know, brings forward three nominating uh, nominations and it takes it to the executive branch, either the governor or the mayor, and says, here are three really qualified candidates, and you choose among them. And so that model, Councilman Flynn, if I recall, was heavily involved in this um, approach, and, and we went with it. But I will say there were some concerns, and, and in retrospect, there are some differences. <laughs> Judges are career professionals paid a full-time salary for the rest of their lives. <laughs> They are not volunteers. <laughs> they are not unpaid or barely compensated volunteers. <laughs> they are a very different type of position and they don't turn over at the rate of several per year. <laughs> they typically are appointed once every three to five years. We have a board of nine individuals, if I'm not mistaken, and they turn over several per year. So there is a rate of turnover differential in judicial appointments, and there is a, a difference in the vetting and the difference in a career professional um, appointment versus a volunteer board. So there are some differences that we maybe um, have, have lived and learned a little bit. So with that, we have had some years of experience now, and the nominating committee, I will just say, has served with distinction. These three volunteers have served um, with zero compensation, I will say. The nominating committee is not compensated. These individuals have worked hard. They have put themselves out there. They have vetted, they have interviewed, and they have worked hard to try to send candidates. And also think about this. It's one thing to be a judicial nominee, to be two judicial nominees who aren't selected every single time. It's another thing to be two volunteers who you know aren't gonna be selected every time. Think about that. I'm sending up three volunteers, two of whom every time are not going to be selected. That's a, that's a thing. So that's the context we've been with for five years. And then fast forward, and the Citizen Oversight Board came to me and asked me to sponsor an ordinance with some changes. So I'm going to turn it over to Julia Richman, um, who's chair of our Citizen Oversight Board, um, to present to us the ordinance change that she's asked um, me to sponsor and is going to ask this committee to consider today. 
Julia. Thank you, uh, Council Member, and, and thank you all for uh, considering this change today. I think it's a, a real mark of uh, accomplished legislators who can look at something that they made themselves and then uh, take a new look at it a, a little bit of time later. Um, I'm joined today by the Vice Chair of the Citizen Oversight Board, Nick Weber, so thank you for being here, and of course, our new monitor, Liz Castle, who will um, present to you in a subsequent agenda item. Uh, so just, uh, you know, again, thank you all for, you know, coming to the table with this um, discussion topic. It has been uh, a really important set of years for the Citizen Oversight Board and a very busy set of years. Um, I'll, I'll get into our ordinance changes uh, here pretty quickly. Um, just a little bit of context on the Citizen Oversight Board and uh, some of these changes relate to that context. Um, the current board has no members of the board that joined uh, before 2020, so our board is fairly new. Um, I myself joined January of 2020, and um, in, in part, uh, the work of the board is both intensive and exhaustive, um, you know, when you think about the spectrum of topics considered in public safety. Uh, it's wide, right? It's everything from breastfeeding in the jail to officer-involved shootings, right, and, and everything in between. So, um, you, you know, the work of the board is, um, at least for me as the chair, is somewhere between five and ten hours a week. Um, and I have served on uh, probably six community boards, and that's by far, and I've been chair of most of them. Um, it's by far the most work of any community board. So. Um, you know, part of our turnover is because uh, when board members feel that they don't have the time to commit, they step down um, because there's just too much work to do without um, the commitment of those board members. Um, so we've recently had a number of longtime board members, including those who helped to um, pass this original ordinance change, um, uh, you know, sort of no longer on the board. Um, so the, the proposed ordinance changes are threefold. The first is the removal of the nominating committee, um, and Council Member Kanich, you know, highlighted uh, that A, that committee has been really doing incredible work, and so this is not a critique of those community members. They have volunteered their time to serve uh, the city in a unique way, and so this isn't, you know, that they haven't done their job. They've absolutely done their job, and they've done the best job that they can. What we have seen in the past few years is that it takes um, anywhere from eight months to two years to fill a board vacancy. And with the volume of work that we've got on the board, vacancies really matter. Uh, you know, for a good portion of last year, we had five members on the board. Um, and that is just, it's too much work for too few people. So we need to sort of speed up the process. So there are two kind of key things in the nominating committee that are, are not working. One is the need to elevate three candidates at once creates a real blockage. So even if we have one good candidate, right, we can't move forward with that one good candidate until we find two other people who we're gonna reject anyway. Um, and so that, you know, is a real challenge. The second is just the number of steps in the process is, is burdensome. And so it's not that the, you know, nominating committee is slow or, you know, that they're not showing up to the task. It's just that, you know, we've added a number of additional steps in this process that are unique from other boards in the city. Now, you know, removing the nominating committee does place a greater burden on council members and the board itself in terms of recruiting and making sure that we have got good community participation and are identifying community members who uh, can serve on the board. So uh, this will push work back to you and it will push work back to us um, as well. So that, you know, moves us to the return of direct appointments. Um, and the idea is still that we'll rotate between council and the mayor's office, um, looking to ensure that we represent the city fully on the board, so across districts, um, across identities, et cetera. Um, third, uh, we're really looking at, you know, an overall revamp of the recruiting process. We will do knowledge transfer with the um, nominating committee to understand, you know, what candidates they've had in the pipeline, who those folks are, and ensure that if there are board seats, we can fill them with people that they've already engaged with, and then understand, you know, opportunities for us to um, better connect with the, the community so folks know that we exist and can engage with us. Uh, the second main change is modifying the compensation structure um, based on the meetings attended, so that's much more like um, the, the Civil Service Commission than um, a general um, monthly allocation. And part of the reason we want to do that is that, um, you know, we meet four hours a month at least, and that's not considering the work that you need to do in order to prepare for those meetings. 
Um, and we feel that if we increase the compensation of the board, we may also increase the diversity of the board members. Um, so we have currently eight board members, and of those eight, at least six are senior executives in their organization. So the CEO of a law firm, I lead a thousand person organization, um, you know, so we have flexibility in our schedule, right? And that's great, but like maybe we don't want just senior leaders, um, you know, as board members. So we've recently added, um, you know, a, a couple of members who are sort of not the C-suite, and I think that's really bringing, you know, a breadth of thought to our work, and I'm excited about uh, where that can go. But just increasing the compensation a little bit, so it's $100 a meeting versus $100 a month, um, we think can make a meaningful difference. And then we have a little bit of squishy language about um, how long members can serve and what happens if they resign and how long they're expected to stay after they resign and things like that. And because we've had um, some turnover the past you know, two years, uh, it's been actually confusing for those members. Like, am I done? Can I be off the board? Or you know, do I need to continue to stay? So this just clarifies that a little bit um, and allows us to have uh, yeah, just more clarity in terms of like, when are you to attend and when are you to stop attending? Um, if you are leaving the board. So that's really um, it for the proposed ordinance changes. I'm happy to take any questions on that. Can I just add one quick clarification? Just so for, for council members, you'll, you'll know that many of our appointments say similar things, which is until a successor is duly appointed. That allows a member to continue serving if they would like to until a successor is duly appointed. It's not an obligation. If you're moving out of state, if you're sick, if you can't keep serving, it, 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 it doesn't require you. It's not a legal obligation. And so, you know, the way our code is written is sometimes legalese, but the interpretation of the attorneys is generally consistent regardless of slight variations in how that's drafted and so the intent and the way we should be communicating this with all of our boards is similar which is that if a board member is able to keep serving it's certainly helpful to our city if they're not no one should ever feel like they need to and if any of us hear of a person on a board who's in a confused state let's send them to our legal counsel or let's Let's check in with them, but you know, right, we certainly hope that our 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 you know this particular board is is now able to get that support and clarification going forward. Um, so our cleanup will hopefully help, but we also are always here for those questions, and our legal staff is always here for those questions. So, all right, with that, um, I think that we did not have anyone sign up for public comment, which was the next thing on our agenda. So we are now open for questions, and I have the first council member in the queue is Councilman Cashman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Julia, thank you for your, your service to the city and your presentation. Um, it, t I, I didn't hear clearly what the current remuneration is and what you're proposing. Can you ask the question again? Sorry. Yeah, so what the board members, how are they uh, remunerated mm -hmm. and how will that change? So currently we receive a stipend of I think $100 per month and this would be $100 per meeting. And so it's, it's basically doubling uh, the compensation for board members. Um, we believe that we can absorb that mm -hmm. in the COB's budget this fiscal year and um, depending on you know how it looks next fiscal year we'll need Is to that in line with, with a similar board? Uh, it's, it's aligned with similar boards of similar workload. Right. Um, so we're not a policy board, we're not an advisory board, like we are actually active in the city processes and so similar to the Civil Service Commission in that way. Okay, not, not a lot of dough, but hopefully uh, no. it, it helps, shows a little bit of respect for the service rendered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Next up, Councilmember Sawyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for this. I just, something you said I wanted to follow up on really quickly. So, um, right now, the board members who are there are generally executive leadership of some kind throughout the city. Is that right? And the goal is to get um, some new uh, board members who maybe aren't executive leadership but have different um, experience that would be valuable on the Citizen Oversight Board. So, not to add work to your plate, but is there is there any um, pathway for those new members to become 
leadership, right? So uh, if there is a board, if we've got a board and you know everyone is set, I guess uh, it doesn't incentivize people to want to continue to be a part of it because there's no leadership pathway forward for them. So wondering whether you have looked at the potential for um, if we are going to be sort of removing barriers to add more people, um, how to build the, in the opportunity for leadership positions within the Citizens Oversight Board um, so that there is some sort of pathway there. Thank you so much for that question. So I, I think um, the answer to your question is there actually is a pathway to leadership within the Citizen Oversight Board. So I myself joined the board three years ago and became the chair. 18 months ago. Um, what I was mentioning was more about people's seniority in their careers, in their jobs outside of the board. Um, and so the majority of our members are, you know, we have a CEO of a law firm, we have, um, you know, leaders of community organizations. I, you know, I run one of the estates agencies. Um, and so, you know, we are in a position where we have schedule flexibility and feel that, um, there may be two barriers for people wanting to join the board. One, not having schedule flexibility, and two, not having the ability to take time off of work to do board activities. Um, and so that's why the compensation is important and um, recognizing that you know, the workload probably won't change. We at least want to deal with the compensation side of it so that we could encourage more people. So an example would be you know, our board meetings are 10 to noon twice a, week, twice a month. Um, and so I take off four hours of work basically to do that, and I have the flexibility to do that because you know I don't have to ask for permission for that. Um, but other folks, you know, maybe not. We have one board member who, um, you know, because of the technology rules of her organization, uh, can't use her work computer for purposes of the board, and so we're looking to get her a different computer, right? But there's no process for that. We're actually like kind of scratching technology services heads around it because she's not an employee, and you know, she should be able to do board service using. Um, you know, technology. So there, there are some interesting things like that where we're just, we don't have a routine around um, board members who may not have advantage um, in the same way. So that's really the idea. Yeah, and I appreciate that and, and I definitely understand that. I guess my question is, you know, if we are, are trying to find more people to participate in the board who have lived experience or things like that, um, it, I guess I'm asking a cultural question, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. we can throw money at it as the day is long. The cultural question is, is a person who might be have very valuable lived experience but does not have executive leadership skills, is there a path forward for them on this board? Um, and will the other members of the board be willing and, and able to change the culture of the board such that those people have uh, fair opportunity to participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll highlight when we go through our strategic plan a couple of other things we're doing to try and increase uh, attention, participation, and diversity of the board. Um, so a, a couple things being we're looking at alternative meeting schedules. Uh, we deal with city staff and so there are some choices to be made about when we have our meetings like you all, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe there's a meeting a quarter or something that's a alternative time of the week. We're starting to meet with community um, organizations directly as part of our official um, meetings so that we're really connecting in community where community is as opposed to, you know, you got to join our Zoom. We do feel that our, our Zoom allows for a lot more uh, flexibility and participation, right? You don't have to come down to the, you know, center of downtown and take off time to drive and things like that. So, um, you know, we have felt like that's been a good alternative mode. Um, we are also looking more broadly at community engagement to ensure that folks know we exist and uh, know what we're for. Um, and part of that is, you know, the, the key metric for me is anytime there's a protest, there are signs that say, you know, we need independent oversight of the police force. And it's like, like darn it, we have that, you know? So I think it, when we start to have less of those signs, right, or maybe we'll never have less of those signs because we need more oversight always, but, um, you know, there there is some indicator there about community really being familiar with and buying into the mission um, of the board and the OIM in general. So it's, it's not a direct answer, um, but I would say, you know, 
the board is uh, one of the more fun boards I've ever served on in terms of culture and connection. And, um, you know, we're dealing with really hard stuff, but I think we have a really nice connection among board members. So. Okay. And do you think that um, now that we have chosen a new monitor and they're, in, you know, and that's official, that that might help some of that workload a little bit? Um, it, I'm just, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary amount of work. We can't even get people to volunteer to, for like, you know, one hour a month, let alone um, the work that's a level like this. So obviously it's a labor of love and a calling um, for the people who are participating, which is amazing. But I'm just curious whether now having a monitor full time will really, uh, you know, a, a full um, hired monitor as opposed to an interim will help support you a little bit better as well. Uh, personally, for me, it will reduce my workload significantly, and Liz can never leave. So um, <laughs> I'm not recruiting again uh, in my term on the Citizen Oversight Board. I've done it twice now, and that's enough. Um, you know, I think both having a monitor, having clear direction from the monitor's office, and not that our interim monitor hasn't provided clear direction, but I think uh, you know, an appointed leader really is is the key. And then the second thing is, and I'll, I'll talk about this under a different agenda item, is that the board has um, endeavored into a strategic plan. And so now that we have our strategic plan, that helps us not address every possible problem under the sun and really helps us focus our work. Um, we've never had sort of subcommittees or done subcommittee work, but I think there, it creates an opportunity for that um, and, and just sort of aligning work to people's passions and interests and things like that, as opposed to everyone in the board having to do everything. Yeah. Um, and so I think that will really be an advantage for us. Awesome. Well, I feel like I'm asking questions too early because you're, <laughs> there's been a couple of things that you're like, it's coming. So I'm yeah. going to stop asking questions and let you get to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Councilman Flynn. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, more of a comment than a question <coughs> prompted by, uh, uh, by the chair's opening remarks about the nominating committee and, and fully understanding the context. It seemed like a good idea at the time <clears throat> not particularly working out uh, as efficiently as we hoped. I just want to, uh, as a matter of record, uh, point out that when we established a nominating committee for the Board of Ethics uh, appointees, there was a sort of a different flow there. Uh, the members of the Board of Ethics rule and issue opinions on matters involving us personally, and I think that that, uh, that establishes the case that we would want to keep the nominating committee in place so that we are not directly appointing members of the Board of Ethics who would rule on matters over us. So I just wanted to have that uh, as a matter of record uh, and, uh, and uh, for future councils to keep in mind when it comes to the Board of Ethics. Fundamentally different than the role here that we're talking about. Thank you. Thanks. That's a really great distinction, Councilman Flynn. Thanks for sharing that. And I think they've had less turnover and less challenges recruiting for that board. So it hasn't shown the same challenges that this one has. So, you know, a good a good reason why it's worth trying things. And it's important. If we don't try different things in government, we will not learn. And it's important for us to do that. At this point, um, the queue is cleared. So um, it looks like we do have a motion in the system. My system's a little slow. Councilman Cashman, a seconder, Councilwoman uh, Gilmore. And do we have any need for a roll call on this? It looks like no. So this is going to move on to the full uh, floor. Um, and uh, so we are good there. And at this point, then, um, Julia, you can continue your presentation to the next topics. You're still the main event here <laughs> with um, presentations, so no more voting. And I think um, with a big introduction coming. Uh, so thank you again, uh, and appreciate your support on that item. Um, so we'll go through a little bit of information about what the board's been up to. Maybe that would have been useful before you voted, but you know, since we've nah, already- we get the business done first. <laughs> then then <laughs> the Q&A can for? go on forever with yeah. the business done. So thank you for getting that out of the way. So, uh, you, you know, a few things of note. Uh, we have worked extensively on um, some policy and process with uh, the Department of Safety and uh, the Public Integrity Division. That is uh, really tiring work, and I will say that these policies are uh, convoluted and complex, and um, I, I can bring up an example of where the 
Um, union appoints their own oversight members, so you know we could talk about best practices in another meeting. But um, we worked to publish a policy last year that had been really in process for like six to 10 years before that. Um, and I think I brought it up to you when I presented our annual report last year. This has just been a lot of confusion, a lot of churn. We lost versions, the city attorney turned over. You know, it's like, this is kind of like a bad government mess. And so I'm proud to say that we published a version of a policy that then we can hold uh, the department accountable too. Um, that is an imperfect policy and to the point of, you know, we need to continue to revise it. We know we will come back with additional revisions and that that's necessary and, and we're excited to do that. Uh, we completed hiring of our uh, new independent monitor and so, uh, you know, a few things on that. Uh, it was a very broadly publicly engaged process. Uh, in the, process, the two rounds of hiring we hosted uh, more than uh, two community forums. Um, we engaged a wide uh, array of stakeholders, including the public safety departments themselves. Um, in that process, um, you know, I am sad that I had to, you know, lead a recruitment twice, but I am glad at the outcome because the community was much more receptive to the uh, second two co candidates that we had than the first three. So real, you know, a good decision on behalf of the board there, even though, you know, it extended the period of an interim for longer and um, Liz will uh, do a little bit to highlight, you know, sort of what she's been up to since she joined uh, about a month ago. Um, we endeavored into strategic planning last year and that was a really excellent uh, activity for us to just, as I mentioned, you know, sort of coalesce our thinking, decide what we want to do, set some bold goals, but also create you know, uh, measurable activities for us to pursue. Um, and that will very much help us sort of be laser focused on the work that we want to get done and help um, make better decisions about when we want to take on work ad hoc. Um, we've also sort of updated our web page and provided uh, more clear information about the overall oversight um, environment. And that was part of an overall um, public awareness campaign that I'll, I'll say a little bit more about. Um, you know, just a few things um, that are continuing to be uh, concerns for us. So uh, Leroy Taylor was um, a community member who was incarcerated and uh, died last year around this time. Um, he uh, had sought medical attention for at least five days before his death, and um, the death is ruled uh, natural causes, but he certainly could have received better, better medical attention. Um, there was some debate about whether he died in the jail or died at um, Denver Health, but either way, um, it's worth mentioning to you all that no one has been held accountable and we don't have a single process change related to that um, individual's death in uh, the jail. And I'll remind uh, this board that, you know, being put in jail is not a death sentence and it shouldn't be. Um, and so in this case, you know, we have a community member who um, was neglected perhaps from a medical standpoint and didn't have to die. Um, so the, the general board concern about the relationship of Denver Health is just the lack of accountability, confusing handoffs between who has information about what, who's making decisions about what. And then in this case, right, you know, maybe the nurse was uh, let go from Denver Health, but there was no you know, sort of coalescing on what's the best process, how do we do this differently in the future, how do we prevent this from happening again. So, you know, just sort of gaps and, and you know, kind of bad contractor handoffs, um, if I could, you know, reduce that to uh, a few words. Um, next is, you know, we have uh, continued uh, concerns about the Public Integrity Division despite our policy implementation, and we're seeing the weaknesses of that policy. Um, you know, the, the oversight processes in the city are very complex, and there are lots of decision makers throughout the process, and so it can feel very much like a black hole where any random stakeholder gets to make a different decision than the board or the group deciding um, or, you know, set to, to be in charge of a decision. So, you know, continued work there, and, and this is just an example of that. Obviously, um, the Denver Sheriff's Department staffing continues to be a challenge and an issue, and, you know, not only is that for the, you, you know, um, the workforce themselves, but also, you know, people who are um, incarcerated in their experience with out time and um, civility and, you know, just sort of basic um, human rights. So, um, and then the last thing is, you know, it, it decrease in concern because we just have one vacancy left, but, um, you know, last year was really hard in terms of, you know, just replacing um, longtime uh, board members. So, quick on that. Um, I'd like to introduce, uh, with a lot of fanfare and if I had a trumpet, I would blow it, um, Liz Castle, who is uh, our new monitor, and uh, Liz, if you'd like to come up and say 
say a few words. Can I do that or do you need to? Okay. Please join us. Welcome to the City Council Chambers for the first time. Certainly won't be the last, but we welcome you. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Good morning, all. My name is Elizabeth Perez Castle, and I am your new Denver Independent Monitor. Um, I am truly humbled and honored by the um, by the appointment of this position, and I will work tirelessly to gain and accept the trust of this. Um, uh, council, the community, and law enforcement. I um, have been fortunate to work with the COB. They have um, been incredibly supportive to me in uh, onboarding onto the position. While I was preparing to apply for the position, I spent a lot of hours reviewing the um, meetings on the Citizens Oversight Board that are recorded and are online, and that was tremendously helpful to me, both as a citizen, as an, as an applicant, to understand all of the issues that are being addressed by the Citizens Oversight Board and the community and law enforcement. As you all know, law enforcement um, including DPD, Denver Sheriff's, Manager of Safety, all attend those hearings on a rotating basis, and that, um, I believe, is incredibly helpful for the community to understand what is being done both by the Citizens Oversight Board and by the Office of the Independent Monitor. So I am uh, truly, as I say, that humbled and honored to have been appointed. I've been a member of the Denver community since 1980, young, <laughs> a long time ago. I moved to Colorado in 1981 and then moved to Denver in 1985, yes. Um, I will, I pledge to work uh, tirelessly <laughs> to, again, earn your trust earn the trust of the community and the trust of law enforcement um, and be uh, be seen as someone who is fair um, and also holds people um, accountable. My goal is to continue the great work that has been done so far by the Office of the Independent Monitor. This agency has done tremendous work uh, for the city of Denver, for the community of Denver, and bridged, um, had a bridge between law enforcement and the community. Um, recently, under the leadership of Greg Crittenden, the uh, interim monitor, um, and now his training of me. And uh, this office is staffed by exceptionally passionate, um, professionals who do this work because they believe in it and because um, they believe that it is what is best for our community and wish to serve our community. My mission is to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community through transparency and a continued accountability. To increase the trust that needs to happen between our community and that of law enforcement. To continue to um, have those conversations together with all stakeholders and everyone that is involved. I have a dedication to the community and to law enforcement to make sure that those lines of communication continue to remain open. Uh, I joined the Office of the Monitor on January 4th. I have figured out where the microwave is, uh, where the bathrooms are. Um, so I've been there slightly over um, a month. I have received an incredibly warm welcome from all of the uh, members of the office. I've also received an incredibly warm welcome from law enforcement. I've already had the opportunity um, the pleasure to meet with Chief Thomas, Chief Diggins, and Manager of Safety, Saldate. They have all offered their cooperation, their knowledge, their welcome, and, um, and I, I truly appreciate it. 
We've had, um, I've also had the opportunity to meet with community members. I have attended several community forums already um, and uh, both online, which is one of the great things that I guess has come out of COVID is the ability for so many people of the community to have um, a voice and to have the accessibility to these kinds of meetings and meetings um, that are of concern to them. So I've had the opportunity to do that as well. I've also had the opportunity through my office, the Office of the Independent Monitor, to attend a Bridging the Gap program, which is our police and youth um, program. It's an uh, all-day program. They eat meals together. They converse together. The kids are taught about their constitutional rights. And um, the officers that attended were wonderful with these kids and um, volunteered their time to do that. Uh, I'm currently assessing the, as I stated, I'm, I'm fresh, fresh, still a, a newborn here. Uh, I'm currently assessing the needs of the office by meeting all of the, um, the members of my office, the different teams that we have policy, outreach, investigative team, and, um, and assessing what needs they have and anticipate that I will later on reach out to you and in the near future um, to discuss potential uh, additional support or resources for the office. Please feel free to reach out to me directly to my office if you have any recommendations, concerns, citizens' concerns. Um, I, my uh, office is always open. I will always be available and address any concerns you may have as quickly um, as I can. I look forward to working with all of you, all members of the community and law enforcement. Uh, on behalf of the people of Denver. I believe with the cooperation of everyone involved, we will strive and we will succeed and we will continue to make Denver safe, both for our community and for law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Um, all right, I'm turning it back now to our chair, uh, Julia. And we didn't talk about time. You have very few slides, but there is a lot of detail in one of them. So I'm thinking, is it possible, to, should we aim for like 11.30? Does that seem realistic? I didn't know if you were kind of showing this as an illustration or presenting all the content. So we can go as quickly as you'd like. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's, that's like 20 minutes. So, yeah. okay. and then great. that way we have a lot of time for Q&A. Does that Perfect. work? That works great. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this slide is only useful to you if you have a magnifying glass, so I'll actually <laughs> skip it. That's kind of but why I <laughs> asked. <laughs> um, it is a summary of our strategic plan on one page, so um, if you only have a printer with one piece of paper left, that's good. Um, so as I mentioned, we endeavored into strategic planning this year. I think the board was really aligned on, I'll go back, um, on the three strategies that we are pursuing. So the first is really looking at adequate funding and operational resources. Um, I'll say, you know, you all have given us an increased budget and uh, aligned a board administrator to the work of the board, and that has had a significant impact on our ability to do work. So thank you for that investment in the board. Um, I'm actually not sure how we would do this without that because there's just too much to keep track of and for us to make any progress, you know, having a staff member who is um, you know, keeping that all together is, is really important. So thank you for that investment and we will um, continue to, you know, focus on ensuring that um, the work we're doing is aligned with resources. The second is um, really that community outreach and involvement um, and, and I'll really dive into this uh, pretty deeply when we go through it. And then the last thing is more of a structural matter related to oversight and that's unfettered access to records. Uh, facilities and really focused on um, public transparency and accountability. So the first is adequate funding and operational resources. I'd mentioned, you know, we've worked hard on, on filling the board vacancies and the nominating committee has as well. Uh, we want to sort of uplift the standardization of a board member's onboarding. What information do you need to know? Here's a list of acronyms. You know, here's how you might interpret information that comes your way. You know, we get the monthly disciplinary reports. It's probably 150 pages worth of information every month. And as a new board member, you're like, am I expected to read this and understand what to do with it? So, you know, everything from, you know, how do you get 
information to how do you use your voice effectively on the board and um, you know some of this information is intimidating and maybe unfamiliar with board members just because of the breadth and so having members feel comfortable that they um, can use their leadership in the best way possible um, and then you know clarifying board member roles and expectations uh, just the basics blocking basic blocking and tackling of, of board operations um, number four is hiring a monitor, so whew, done on our plan. Um, number five is ensuring that the monitor is paid competitively, and um, I did my best to increase the salary of the monitor, and then Liz did her best to increase the salary of the monitor, so um, I'm happy about that, and that creates an opportunity for the staff underneath her as well, now that she is paid uh, more in alignment with other senior attorneys in the city. Um, and then just looking at sort of how we're allocating uh, the time of our uh, board administrator. He spent an inordinate amount of time scheduling meetings last year just because of all of the monitor hiring. And so excited that, you know, he may do less of that and we can use uh, more of his skills on research and, you know, policy analysis, et cetera. Um, and then the last step here is really uh, now that we have a permanent monitor creating a performance framework for her and ensuring that we're evaluating her in alignment with that framework. Just as a reminder, we're required to uh, produce an annual report each year. And in the past two years, because we've had an interim monitor, it's been less sort of about that person's performance because really it's like, please don't quit because you keep being asked to do this interim role. And instead, it's really more about the monitor's office. And so we'll have an opportunity both to evaluate the office and the, the, the person um, doing the job. So community outreach. Um, you know, part of uh, what is a huge challenge for us is that oversight is really complex, it's really challenging, and people don't necessarily understand, you know, what's the independent monitor's office, what's the COB, um, the name of our board in general, you, you know, has some tension in it, um, and so, uh, you know, just making sure that people know we're there. Um, I think the monitor recruiting process has been instrumental in us building uh, stronger community partnerships. Um, and we had a broad coalition of community stakeholders and, and organizations who participated in the actual community forums and in um, defining the rubric for the monitor and um, you know participating in um, interviews, et cetera. So that's that's really exciting. And then you know as part of that, we want to be in community with those stakeholders and partnering better with them. Um, you know we want to be more visible in in events um, and outreach and making sure that you know we're um, aligning our efforts to the neighborhoods that are perhaps, you know, most policed, most impacted by uh, systemic racism and, and things like that that we see in this, this system. And then, um, you know, how do you articulate a process that has like 7,000 steps? And so making sure that resources are available to community members so that they know how to file a complaint, um, follow up on that complaint, that their concerns are addressed, that they have a forum for, you know, making comments in public, et cetera. And then, you know, as you all are, we are also preparing for political change. So the uplift on a new mayor and many new uh, council members is, you know, of course going to present a challenge to us uh, just in terms of, you know, we've built a, a rapport with all of you, and so making sure that we have a continued rapport with stakeholders. I, I will say that, you know, a number of the um, mayoral candidates are making statements about, you know, adding more and more police. I'm not sure that, you know, from our seat on the board, that's the root of the problem um, in the city. And so, you know, there are some concerns around that, especially since the police are not even operating at their authorized force uh, today. So. Um, Adding more vacant seats maybe doesn't <laughs> get us to an outcome. Um, so the, la the last thing is um, really unfettered access to records and facilities. We've had conversations with you all about this in the past is sort of, you know, the flow of information from um, particularly the police department, but, but also the sheriff's department to the monitor's office and, you know, how body-worn camera footage <laughs> is um, uploaded and with what timing. Um, we've recently put some operating procedures in around that. Um, how, how frequently and on what circumstances the monitor is uh, made aware of things, um, you know, just some of the basics operating principles across departments and um, the monitor's office itself. Uh, we are interested in um, ensuring that the monitor has ad hoc drop-in access to the facilities run in public safety. So today it's very structured and scheduled. The board itself, you know, we get to go on the nice clean tour of the nicest, newest facilities, you know, and we want a little bit more uh, realistic access to uh, the people and uh, conditions um, in all of the facilities. 
Um, I had mentioned, you know, force review boards um, and, and some, you know, uh, fox watching the hen house kind of situation, and I think there's a lot to be said uh, around this uh, item number three. Um, so an example would be, you know, in some of the shoot boards, well, in the shoot boards, there are two community members who are serving, and those members have been serving for like two decades each. Um, and so if you think about the independence of those community members from, uh, you know, their, um, the groups that they're overseeing, you know, there are some weaknesses there. So there are like, you know, a dozen of these examples where, you know, we're not sort of independent and we're not objective and it's gotten a little too buddy-buddy um, in the approach. Uh, the, the next one is really um, continued in uh, transparency in the process governing misconduct and policy. And so, as I mentioned, you know, these are really complex processes and basically at every step there is uh, movement away from the judgment in policy to individual judgment or political judgment or, um, you know, uh, something related to a settlement or something related to a process that would be extended. And so there's lots of just individual actors in something that's supposed to be structured and fair. Um, you know, the time uh, it takes to work through many of these uh, mis misconducts uh, issues is you know, one to two years, two to three years. It just takes forever, and so by the time you get to the end, who even remembers, you know, what happened when they were there kind of thing. So lots of opportunity there. Um, I think both the board and the monitor's office are interested, in, uh, more interested in uh, reporting on when there's a disagreement uh, between our organizations and um, those making uh, the disciplinary uh, recommendations. Um, and bringing more transparency to that. We have to be careful because some of this is, you, you know, um, HR related processes, et cetera, but we do feel like there's more room for saying, you know, the outcome was X and, and we didn't agree with X. Um, and so uh, letting the community know that, you know, what happened wasn't necessarily what had to happen um, in a disciplinary case. So more to come on that. And then uh, the last is really, I had mentioned this, but you know, Denver Health is a really critical actor in the public safety ecosystem in the city. And, um, you know, the sort of bulk contracting approach has weaknesses, but the also just basic oversight, accountability, reporting relationship between a city and a contractor, um, in this case, um, we think is, is not strong enough um, for accountability and doesn't necessarily take um, those who are incarcerated into uh, enough consideration in terms of uh, their performance. So uh, the board is personally invested uh, in, in particular in the relationship between Denver Health and um, the Sheriff's Department and, and that relationship, and so that will be a big focus for us. So that's really it in terms of the plan. We're really excited about that. As I mentioned, it will help us direct our work and, uh, you know, sort of not have to jump on every thing that comes, every outrage, every horror, every, you know, mistake that's made and can help us really proceed structurally to fix um, challenges in the oversight environment in the city. Thank you so much. Um, I neglected to acknowledge that Councilwoman Seda Baca had joined us online. Apologies for that delayed acknowledgement. And then we have Councilwoman Gilmore in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair, and want to um, echo the welcome to our Madam Independent Monitor. Um, we're very grateful to have you on board and um, want to acknowledge um, Mr. Weber for his involvement on the board and commend you, Julia, uh, for your work, uh, both last year um, and the continuation of that work. Um, I was honored um, by um, Council President uh, Torres allowing me to uh, take her uh, spot on the, the committee and the depth of um, preparedness um, for the interviews, the depth of the conversation, the questions that were asked. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that we landed where we landed and um, looking forward to that work together. And um, so just wanna say a thanks, but then also um, this, this really comes together really well around um, the visibility in the community um, and how important that is, especially as we make these uh, legislative changes to increase the participation, quite honestly, of black and brown folks in the far northeast, in Montbello and Green Valley Ranch, and making that accessible um, because we continue to deal with uh, the historic systems that are in place and 
they are negatively affecting our community's health. And so to do more of that, and I would just point to, um, and this might be um, a conversation to be had with Clerk Lopez's office and the clerk and recorder, because I will tell you, um, I would have thought that Calvin um, from the clerk's office lived in Montbello because they were at every single Saturday event that we had in District 11, and we've got a lot of them, but the outreach and engagement made such a difference, and just recognizing people's faces, and you've got a great team um, as well, and so just wanna get that out more, and so um, would ask if there uh, is an opportunity, especially during the budget process, um, if I am so blessed to be back here for a third term, uh, that's really important and it makes all the difference. And I think that that's the only way we're going to improve is if we work hand in hand with community to hear their concerns and especially around youth uh, programming that we need. So desperately expansion of nonprofit services for the far Northeast. Um, it's, there's no mistake that we have an increase in youth gun violence uh, because there are uh, societal and systemic issues that we continue to deal with and we want to do better and do differently. And so uh, just thank you for the work and look forward to hopefully seeing y'all out in the community a little bit more. And again, um, welcome uh, to Elizabeth and um, looking forward to building that relationship out as well. So thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, and thank you for your service. We know it was a lot of hours of work representing our body in that process, so I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say thank you. Um, next up, Council President Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Julia. Um, I, I think just to um, emphasize Councilwoman Gilmore's comments, I also wanna thank the board, the selection committee as well, for your courage to decide we've gotta go back out. and. Um, and, and having met Liz and uh, uh, really energized by um, the dedication she brings to this work, um, the experience and, uh, and the lens that you bring to this work, I think we're in really, really wonderful hands. So it was the right decision um, and I appreciate you making it, although it was probably really difficult at the time to, to, to do it. So thank you for doing that. Um, I do wanna um, just ask you a, a question about the third strategic plan um, uh, uh, section about unfettered access to records and facilities. I agree and think that that should be as unrestricted as possible for um, the monitor's team and the monitor. Um, are there things, is that more of an arrangement or an agreement with departments or is it, or is it legislative? Uh, thank you so much for that question. I think it is both an agreement and a policy matter. So in particular, there are some concerns that, uh, and in particular with body-worn camera footage that, um, you know, it may impact uh, victims' rights. So, you know, if you've got a wide camera view and you, uh, you, you know, catch something that doesn't involve the officer that you're looking to discipline, um, you know, what impact does that have? The particular uh, subject matter that is of, of top concern is um, child sex abuse cases because that's uh, more heavily regulated on the state level than it, it, any, any other kind of data in this world. Um, you know, we believe, uh, you know, the monitor's office A doesn't want to get access to that information, but we also believe that the system can allow for differentiation of the kinds of information, and you could have, you know, a, a classification that says this is, you know, ultra super mega classified, and it doesn't go except with, you know, clear exceptions or, you know, a specific, uh, you know, action uh, step, and so, you know, that's always been this sort of albatross, but I'm not sure it's actually a problem. Okay, okay, that's helpful. And I think um, uh, anything that I can do that this body can do to help support that because um, you shouldn't have to face a new conversation every time there's a new chief, a new manager of safety. Um, there should be a, a pretty consistent way that you're, you're able to access the information um, that the COB and the OIM need um, to, to, to make decisions that you've got to make. So I appreciate and um, a double up on the um, community engagement recommendation. I think um, there's a lot of uh, uh, corners of our community that have no idea that there's an accountability measure for, our, for law enforcement. So um, any way that we can be helpful in that effort as well. Thank you and thank you, Liz. Thank you. 
Thank you. Do I see Councilwoman Gilmore up again? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was so gl glad that we got to this place that um, <laughs> I forgot to um, ask my one question. So um, I would love to understand a little bit more um, around training accountability. There has been um, a lot of discussion, and um, I'm not afraid to say every time I get briefed on a settlement, um, my question back is, <clears throat> What's the change in process? What's the training protocol? What is the accountability? And um, I'm not aware of any policy requirement for our Department of Safety to create expanded uh, transparency around how often are you trained for implicit bias? How often are you trained in de-escalation? Uh, and the list would go on and on and on. Um, but to have some transparency around that, I think that that goes a long way to rebuilding the trust that has been broken with community and um, would just like to hear from you um, what your thoughts are on that. And, um, you know, there ha always has been that, well, if you ask us, we will tell you, but we know that that doesn't always work and that that does not then build a foundation to address institutionalized racism and systems. And so um, just wanted to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about that. Thank you for that question. Um, it, it gives me a lot of reflection over the past three years. So, you know, going all the way back to the report on the police response to the George Floyd protests, right, there were seven recommendations or some number of recommendations related to training. And, you know, there was a lot of, uh, um, coalescence around the need, but not actually effort put into the implementation of that, with the excuse often being, you know, we're sort of understaffed, and so if it's a question about putting an officer on the beat or putting an officer in a chair, you know, doing some learning, we're going to put that officer on the beat. And so it had been, um, you know, sort of a long backlog of training um, that, you know, real action had not been taken on. And, and really, you know, my first meeting on the COB, I think we talked about uh, the need for training and, you know, the... EDI training, uh, de-escalation training, use of force training, um, you know, you name it. Um, in the case of, you know, a recent event, you know, a taser versus a gun training, right? Um, you have to get recertified on the kinds of guns you use and how you use them. Um, and so I think training is, is a longstanding problem. In our meeting um, with Chief Thomas, uh, you know, very recently, he expressed that he felt that they had made uh, real gains on that training. I don't have data to support that, and I don't actually have a way of knowing whether that's true. I'll, I'll take him at his word, but um, you know, it's hard to know the depth and breadth of that training. And you know, is it high quality training? Who's leading it? Who's developing it? All of those things. Um, I'll also say that you know, in the recent um, events with uh, Tyree Nichols, you know, I saw uh, someone I follow on Twitter say something like, you know, how is it that every time there's an officer involved um, you know, abuse or death, that there's a call for investing in training and resources for the police, police departments, right, but not the communities that are police to themselves. Um, and so, you know, I've been reflecting on that a lot, and that sort of gets to the, I think, board's concern about, like, more and more police officers, right? It's like, it's not, it's not a police problem, right? It's a community challenge, and so, um, you know, really focusing on that. So anyway, you know, there's always a policy choice there, but, um, it's very hard for us to know what's true with regard to training. Great, I, I really appreciate you um, just off the cuff talking a little bit more about that and you live and breathe it, but um, that seems like the least that we could possibly do to start to build that relationship back up with community is saying you can be, um, you know, you know that an officer has gone through a regiment of training, especially with the seriousness um, of their position. And we wouldn't want a nurse or a doctor who might be providing care for us not to have kept up with their credentials or ongoing learning, best practices. Um, we've got to um, make sure that people are putting um, the the rubber to the road, um, and especially um, documenting this, because we can't all be um, so egotistical that we're going to be here forever. And so to leave that guiding document, that work for the next 
folks that step in is so important if we're ever going to make lasting change. And so um, thank you again. And thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me get back in the queue. Thanks. Well, um, I had a couple questions, but I will follow up on that first as committee chair, which is that some pieces of this are knowable. And this is where I do think that there is a triangle here, which is there are the safety agencies, there's these independent oversight agencies, and then there is this council of which this committee does have jurisdiction over these topics. And so I will just say that to the extent there is a training curriculum, and there are hours of recorded trainings, that is a knowable thing. And I will just say, um, Anne, as our committee staff, I'm gonna ask you to put this on our follow-up, that we will ask the chief to provide the hours. Um, and I will just say that, um, you know, so, you know, there are places in the curriculum, for example, with a de-escalation, there are particular pieces of curriculum dedicated to this, and the hours dedicated to this are knowable. <laughs> and so if you have not been provided that, we can ask for that, and we can share it back with you. And then in terms of implicit bias, I do not know that that has an hours attached to it versus where it is woven throughout the curriculum, but we're gonna ask both those questions. So we're gonna ask about implicit bias, and we're gonna ask about um, uh, de-escalation. I know for sure from being on the use of force revision committee that that has a particular piece in the curriculum. I'm less sure about how the implicit bias, but both of those are, are pieces of the curriculum that I know, whether they have an hours or a thing attached. And then there is the question of the upfront academy, and then there is the question of re, um, refresher trainings, and so we're going to ask both of those questions. We're going to ask about both those topics. We're going to ask about the academy, and then we're going to ask about refreshers. There is a second question, which is perhaps harder to know, which is how is training reinforced through the relationship between lieutenants and sergeants at the district level? That is harder to document, right? And that is a question that is less, you know, about curriculum that I can document and hours that, you know, so because that is where it does need to be reinforced for it to be real. And so I do understand that that might be harder for a chief to demonstrate through data. But, you know, certainly we can at least get documentation or data on the first two. And I, I do think that the chief is a big, um, supporter of the, I, I forget the acronym, but the bystander training. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that bystander training, you know, is a piece of de-escalation. It's about how a bystander plays a role in de-escalation. We may be using slightly different language than he is, but that is an hours of training. And so I would consider that something our community would have interest in, and it is knowable. So if you did not get data related to your question, then let us be helpful in sharing that data back with you because it is knowable. And, it, and I, I do just wanna make sure to the extent that the George Floyd protests did include recommendations, some of those were accepted by the chief. So I wanna be clear that we're not, this is where I, I do you know, want us to make sure we're putting out accurate information. A number of those training recommendations were accepted and they were implemented. They, the training didn't occur before the protests but they were accepted and they were implemented. And we actually did, I believe, have a one-year report back while Councilman Cashman was chair. And I believe the training, you know, in particular um, on a number of things did occur. So I, I don't want us to be right. sending the message that, well, they, they, they said we didn't have time. I, that was not my recollection mm -hmm. of how that report was received. So I, I don't want folks, I, yeah. I, I thought I might have heard you say something a little different about what was said when that report was received, and, and that, that was not my recollection of how that report was received. I, I think it's been a, a varying response over time, um, and I will say, too, the board has been looking for reportable specific data on this topic since at least this time last year, um, and have yet to get sort of like a spreadsheet. Um, uh, agree that all of the recommendations from the report, with the exception of maybe one, were accepted. Um, and, you know, as of um, uh, Chief Pazin leaving, a, a number of them were not clear as to whether they had been fully implemented or Got just it. accepted. Um, and the breadth of that implementation, right, if you host one cohort for, you know, right. a training, right, is that acknowledgement and is that acceptance or is that... Um, 
you know, the comprehensive nature that is, is being requested in that. Got program. it. And some of, just to be clear for the viewing public, some of those training recommendations were very specific regarding, we, the report uses this term, less lethal force, right? Are you being trained in the use of pepper balls or these types of crowd control measures that were used during the protests, not necessarily the things Councilwoman Gilmore was talking about, which we would consider preventative strategies from bias or preventative strategies from use of force generally. They were about particular things that were deployed during. So two different training topics, both important, one specific to the protests, one specific or general to all good, good policing. Um, so thank you for clarifying that. And it sounds like you're continuing to follow up. Um, and I guess um, if you have not gotten that data and you've requested it, again, these are knowable things where people are relieved of duty to attend training, sign-in sheets and data is collected. So if, if it is not being, it, it is not a, it, those are knowable things. So I guess I'm a little confused and maybe we'll follow up more afterwards. I guess my other question, I'm gonna change topics from training. We ran a ballot measure from this council to clarify the ability for independent legal counsel where there has been um, a need for what I would call zealous advocacy around um, differing opinions about, um, you know, particularly differing interpretations, right? Where, um, you know, you have what I think the ordinance is quite clear about access, but on the ground where you're looking at a particular document or you're looking at a particular procedure, interpretations um, were, you know, basically conflicting about how that ordinance applied and the need for zealous advocacy absent a conflict of interest. And so I was just curious, we've had an interim monitor and obviously this might not have been a time where bringing that charter to life, I don't know, but I guess I was curious if either Elizabeth in her one month or the chair or the vice chair um, has any familiarity on whether or not any independent legal counsel or maybe maybe our ledge counsel knows whether any independent legal counsel has been utilized since the charter amendment um, passed. Um, it has not. Um, and in part, you know, the focus of the office has been really on maintaining operations, throughput on cases, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so less advancement of, you know, these more challenging policy areas and more focus on just core operations. So Got that it. doesn't mean, you know, there wasn't a reason for that. Yeah. Um, it, it just means it hasn't been used. Yet. Got it. Well, and I just, I guess I will say since our new monitor is here, one, um, since this might be kind of, you know, we, we, we usually have, um, you, you don't need to stand. It's, well, you, you may if you'd like to respond, but... This might be the last time we have you here. We usually have you about once a year. So this council will have a big election and some of us may or may not be here. Uh, well, some of us will not be here. <laughs> others, others, voters willing. Um, you know, the, we had a conversation earlier about um, Council President Torres asked the question, is it the ordinance? Is it policy? Is it the culture? Like, what do we rely on? And, you know, I think it's most folks would agree it's all three things are required for the system of oversight to work. You can only get to so much detail in an ordinance. You know, the, it's, you can't legislate for every eventuality. <laughs> Even policy can't dictate where files are kept or who makes phone calls when, right? There's a point at which humans are involved in each of these systems. Um, but I guess that, you know, the the, one of the things I've observed is the web of relationships that are involved. And I think that one of the, 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 the things that I was really pleased to hear is how you had already sat down and met with, right, the leaders of the agencies. And I think that um, one thing I'd like to say, because, you know, we, we, we led this charter amendment, Council President Torres and Councilwoman Gilmore as the sponsors, you know, with some different leadership, right? Um, and so it's there if it's needed, but I hope that it won't be the first phone call that's made because the truth is it's, um, if it is, it means all of those other systems <laughs> have not been invested in, right? Um, because the truth is it's gonna be the most difficult one to deploy, 
right? And so I say that only because, you know, we, you know, our last monitor had been in place for a long time and had really spent a lot of time developing all of those other layers of systems, you know, the communication, where we can fix a policy. Sometimes we had to tweak an ordinance, right? Um, and then knew that there were a few places where we hit the wall and then this tool was really needed. Um, and so I guess maybe there is a question here for you, which is, you know, you've met with the safety leaders, but we also have this administrative leader. You know, the mayor no longer appoints this position, but I do think, I don't know if you've had a chance to sit down with the mayor. We obviously confirmed you as a council and you're here today, but have you had a chance to sit down with the mayor? And do you think that's also, you know, a piece of your plan? You obviously have a big transition coming up, but your thoughts about how that relationship also is important and your approach to kind of that problem solving tree, like, right, you hit a barrier, you know, your thoughts about how you kind of approach problem solving, right, in terms of when, when you hit a challenge, right? And obviously you're, you're new enough, you haven't had to, to do it yet, but you know, you went through a lot of interviews and community forums, you heard about some of the things, right? So just curious about the other branch of government that's out there. Um, thank you for the question. I have not had the pleasure of meeting our mayor um, in my position as independent monitor. I believe I have met him uh, at other events in, in the past. And uh, I look forward to meeting with him. With regards to the process of getting to um, policy or outreach or anything we do, I'm incredibly fortunate that that culture is already in place. The culture that I've noticed in the, in the very short time that I've been there uh, in from the monitor's office with law enforcement and um, and the community is collaboration. They work very hard. They've established relationships um, between investigative agencies in law enforcement and our investigative department in the office of the independent monitor. When there are conflicts, those conflicts are addressed professionally and there are attempts to resolve those conflicts and it, the, again, in the very brief time that I've been there, um, it seems to be a system that is um, mutually respectful and, um, and collaborative. Now, obviously, we will not agree on, on everything, or, and we will disagree on many things. The important thing is to keep the communication open to maintain those relationships so we can have those conversations and see if we can make change. Um, I, I don't know enough to say whether or not we will find ourselves in a situation where we have to seek outside counsel. I understand it is there and, and if necessary and when I will not hesitate um, to use uh, that, uh, that function if need be. But from what I am able to tell right now, I believe there is uh, um, there is collaboration, mutual respect, and a lot is being done through that process. Well, I do hope you get to sit down with the mayor soon. Five months is a long time and a lot can happen. And I actually want to ask our ledge council maybe, I think it would be great for you all to work on an, uh, a memorandum of understanding about the hiring of that position now before you need it. And our ledge council would probably be very helpful as kind of a neutral party to get that done and out of the way so that when and if you need it, it's not happening during a contentious time. And just kind of, you know, it probably feels like the least important thing, but if you have it done and get it out of the way, it just might be an easy thing to check off the list. It's, it's more difficult to do those things when it's an emergency or contentious and, you know, I don't know, just might be some low-hanging fruit. So um, just a couple thoughts. I want to ask my colleagues if there are any other questions for our chair, our vice chair, or our monitor before we let them go about their business. Their volunteer service as board members is deeply appreciated if you would please share that back with the members of the board. 
Um, and uh, I don't think the current vacancy is ours. Is it the mayor's vacancy? Check with our staff, hopefully. If it is, we'll be getting on it, but I, I, I have this strange feeling it's not our turn. So if it is, we will do our duty. This bill will go for a full council, so it'll be about three weeks before it's completed. And so, um, and I wanna just again, thank the members of our nominating committee. They have served and worked so hard these past years. So we wanna thank them one more time. Um, all right, with that, we have several items on consent and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.